we will have sharings uh, on Sanganusati or recollection or reflections on the qualities of the Sangha. Well, we had to trace the formation of the Sangha back to the Bogaya area where uh, the, the Buddha was recollecting the days uh, before, just before his enlightenment. And he mentioned in the Arya Pariyasana Sutta that this park is truly delightful, a lovely grove with a flowing river that's clean and charming with smooth banks. This is good enough for meditation. And so being myself liable to be reborn, understanding the drawbacks in being liable to be reborn, I sought the unborn, supreme sanctuary, extinguishment, and I found it. Being myself liable to grow old, fall sick, die, sorrow, and become corrupted, understanding the drawbacks of these things, I sought the unaging, unailing, undying, sorrowless, uncorrupted supreme sanctuary, extinguishment, and I found it. So this is clearly the Buddha recalling that he found enlightenment, awakening underneath the Bowie tree. And soon, knowledge and vision arose in me. My freedom is unshakable. This is my last rebirth. Now there are no more future lives. And soon after that, a Brahma Sampati reading the thoughts of the Buddha as he was sitting underneath the Bowie tree, decided to come down and invite the Buddha. So Brahma Sampati, disappearing from the Brahma world, reappeared before the Buddha. And then the Liu with its arms in the lotus fashion before his heart and said to the Buddha, Lord, let the Blessed One teach the Dhamma. Let the One well gone teach the Dhamma. There are beings with little dust in their eyes who are falling away because they do not hear the Dhamma. There will be those who will understand the Dhamma. Then, having understood Brahma's invitation, out of compassion for beings, uh, the Buddha surveyed the world with the eye of an awakened one. As the Buddha did so, he saw beings with little dust in their eyes and those with much, those with keen faculties and those with dull, those with good attributes and those with bad, those easy to teach and those hard. And the Sutta continues. So having seen this, the Buddha answered, Open are the doors to the deathless, to those with ears. Let them show their confidence or conviction. Perceiving trouble, O Brahma, I did not tell people the refined sublime Dhamma. So then the thought occurred to the Buddha. To whom shall I teach the Dhamma first? Who will quickly understand this Dhamma? And the Sutta records that he considered Alara Kalama and Uddhaka Ramaputta, but both had recently passed away. And soon his attention was to the five friends who left him just before he went to the Bohi tree. So this marks the origins of the Sangha. So after Brahma Sampati's invitation at Bogaya, the Buddha journeyed to Isipatana near Benares, where his eight companions, the five ascetics, were residing. There he delivered to them the first sermon called the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta the discourse on the wheel of truth. And later portion of the sutta, the Buddha is recorded to have said, so you really know Kondanya, Venerable Kondanya, acquired the name Anya Kondanya, Kondanya who knows, the first Arya on attending Sotapanna, the first stage of sainthood. So out of the five ascetics that were present during the first sermon, only Kondanya attained the first stage of sainthood. So at that time, there was no arahats yet. Soon, the Buddha delivered the second sermon called the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the discourse on the theory of not-self. On hearing the teaching, the five ascetics, now, all five attained liberation or arahat. So only at this stage, there were five arahats. Thus, they became by virtue of utter elimination of defilements. The first Arya Sangha members in this case, the first arahats 
who were the origin of the noble order of the Sangha. Now here, I'd like to show you some important uh, aspects on uh, factors that lead to the decline of the true Dharma as recorded in the Saddhamma Pati Rupaka Sutta. And uh, the Sutta started by a question from Venerable Maha Kasipa to the Buddha. But going straight to the point, the Buddha mentioned, there are these five detrimental things that lead to the decline and disappearance of the true teaching. What five? Is when monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen lack respect and reverence for the teacher, in this case, the Buddha, the teaching, in this case, the Dhamma, the Sangha, the training, the meditation. These five detrimental things lead to the decline and disappearance of the true teaching. And the Buddha continued, there are five things that lead to the continuation, persistence, and enduring of the true teaching. It's when the monks, nuns, laymen, and laywomen maintain respect and reverence for the teacher, the teaching, the sangha, the training, and the meditation. These five things lead to the continuation, persistence, and enduring of the true teaching. Now, why am I showing you this? Well, the, for the past few weeks, we have considered the qualities of the teacher. So this is to understand who the teacher is, in this case, the Buddha and his qualities, so that we can have reason to respect and revere the Buddha. And more recently, we reflected on the qualities of the Dhamma, Dhamma Nusati. So we need to understand and respect and revere the teaching. And of course, today and, and following Sundays, we will talk about the uh, qualities of the Sangha. This will help us to uh, what they call lay the conditions for the continuation and persistence and endurance of the true teaching. Now, not only in this particular sutta that the Buddha mentions these very important conditions, that means uh, respect, reverence for the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, as well as the training, other suttas too, including this one. In the Dutiya Mahanama Sutta, uh, the Buddha at the time was staying in the land of the Sakyans, that means he Bali Kampong, near Kapilavatu, in the Banyan Tree Monastery. Then Mahanama, the Sakyan, went up to the Buddha, bowed, sat down on, to one side and said to the Buddha, Sir, this Kapilavatu is successful and prosperous and full of people with cramped dead ends. In the late afternoon, after paying homage to the Buddha or an esteemed mendicant, I enter Kapilavatu and encounter a stray elephant, horse, chariot, cart, or person. At that time, I lose mindfulness regarding the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. I think if I were to die at that time, where would I be reborn in my next life? So uh, Mahanama was describing the, the, the busyness of Kapilavatu with all the traffic jams and all those things very common in those days. And literally you can be run over by a stray elephant, a horse, chariot, or even a cow. And other suttas also depict this. So even monks or lay people have been run over uh, during this kind of, uh, what they call traffic jams. And the Buddha replied to, Mah to Mahanama, Ma Bayi Mahanama, Ma Bayi Mahanama. Do not fear Mahanama, do not fear. Your death would not be a bad one. Your passing would not be a bad one. A noble disciple who has four things, slums, slopes, and inclines towards extinguishment. What for? It's when noble disciple has experiential confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, and they have ethical conduct. That means sit. That means practice the training in terms of sila, love by the noble ones, and leading to meditation, into concentration. Suppose there was a tree that slants, slopes, and inclines to the east. If it was cut off at the root, where would it fall? Then Mahanama replied, Sir, it would fall in the direction that it slants, slopes, and inclines. And the Buddha continues, In the same way, 
a noble disciple who has four things, slants, slopes, and inclines towards extinguishment. So for those of us, in fact, many of us, you might think, oh, those monks in those days, they have practiced so conscientiously, put so much energy in practicing, and they managed to attain at least the first stage of sainthood, if not other hardship. What about us, lay people? You know, what, what will be to happen to us if we were to pass away for whatever reason these days, especially now during the pandemic? Okay, And the Buddha answers this question nicely in this particular sutta, that so long as we have been putting a lot of effort uh, in having experiential confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha, and put effort in our uh, training as taught by the Buddha. In this case, the first thing is to practice sila, and which leads to uh, mindfulness and concentration. Then it will be to our benefit because we are already leaning in the Dhamma direction and therefore we will be born in a suitable location or plane of existence that has Dhamma surrounding us, that reminds us to practice. Now, as we go on to, uh, to this sharing, we need to get some uh, understanding of the terms we use. And the first one is Sangha, which basically means community. But more commonly, most of us have used Sangha to mean the monastic community, which comprises the bhikkhu and bhikkhunis, the, the monks and the nuns. And in the brackets, the monks observe 227 precepts, whereas the bhikkhunis observe 331 precepts. But the community also contains or covers the noble or worthy ones, often called the Arya disciples, Arya being noble or worthy. And sometimes you will see the word Arya Sangha, Arya being noble or worthy community. Also, terms like Savaka Sangha. Savaka, uh, next page, I will define it as the, the listener. But these are basically enlightened disciples. And uh, in some of the texts, they are described as the four pairs and eight types of disciples. And more of this will be uh, covered by the next speaker uh, in, next, in the coming Sunday. Now, this also covers the enlightened lay and monastics. Now, why did I say enlightened? Because in the Sangha Nusati, recollection, reflection of the qualities of the Sangha, it not only covers the ordinary monks and nuns, it covers enlightened monastics plus enlightened lay people. So there will be some lay people who have attained uh, the early stages, not Arahathub yet, maybe the first stage of sainthood, maybe the second stage, maybe the third stage. So in this text, enlightened lay uh, persons or monastics who have attained at least to the first stage of sainthood or become a stream winner are classified, are come under this Sangha uh, category that we are reviewing today. Now, since we're talking about the Sangha, we might also talk about the lay people. And often we hear the word Upasaka and Upasika. Upasaka means lay men and Upasika, the lay women. But these two are not part of the Sangha. Okay? Sangha is reserved for monastics. And of course, in respect to the qualities of the Sangha, it covers also enlightened lay people. Uh, those are special categories. Not just any lay person, but enlightened. So normally, Upasaka and Upasikas are not part of Sangha, but when referred together with the Bhikkhu and Bhikkhuni community, they are known as Chatu Parisa. Chatu meaning four, in this case, fourfold. Parisa, as underlined, means assembly or following. So Chatu Parisa, the fourfold, means Bhikkhu, Bhikkhuni, Upasaka, and Upasika. So these are the fourfold uh, assembly or following, whether Arya or uh, enlightened or unenlightened monastics or lay people. So they cover the four uh, big groups. And often in the suttas, the Buddha will refer to the monks, the nuns, the laymen, and the laywomen. Okay? So we should not use the word Sangha to include Upasaka and Upasika lightly. Now, just now, we are, during the puja, we have already gone through the various qualities 
of the uh, Sangha. And on the right-hand side, the English translation of the Pali Recycle, I have included small brackets uh, indicating the qual quality number what. Okay, in the Sangha Nusati that we recited, where they are, we are reflecting over, there are basically nine uh, qualities. And clearly, Supati Panno, or practice well, is the first quality. Uju Pati Panno, or translated straightforwardly as the second quality. Nyaya Pati Panno, uh, practice methodically, is the third uh, quality. Samiji Pati Panno, practice masterfully, is the fourth quality. And then moving on, we have Yadidang Chattari, Purisa Yugani, Atta Purisa Pugala. Notice on the right hand side, there are no qualities indicated here. These are descriptions. Why is this so? Because the earlier portion of it, that means uh, quality number one, two, three, four, are the qualities of uh, members of the Sangha who diligently practice what the Buddha taught in this aspect or that aspect and have attained. Uh, various stages of enlightenment. It means the four types of disciples. And the lowest being the first stage of sainthood, Sotapan. And uh, of course, the highest stage, Arahat. So because of the four uh, what are called conscientious practices and qualities of the Sangha, they have attained enlightenment. And this, of course, includes even lay people who manage to attain at least Sotapan. They will become, they will be covered under this category. And then following, Esa Bhagavato, Savaka Sango, Ahuneo, Pahuneo, Dakineo, Anjalikaraneo, Anutarang, Punyake, Tang, Lokasati. And on the right hand side, the English translation, we have worthy of gifts as quality number five, worthy of hospitality, quality number six, uh, worthy of offerings as quality number seven, and worthy of respect, quality number eight. And incomparable field of merit for the world as quality number nine. So this page contains, uh, indicates the nine qualities of the uh, Arya Sangha. Now let's move over to the first quality, Supatipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sangha, Bhagavato, which normally are referred to as the Blessed One, translated as Blessed One. In other words, the Buddha. And Savaka Sango, uh, we will do it that. Now, today we have the term Sangha Anusati, Sangha Nusati. Anusati meaning uh, to recollect, to reflect, in this case, uh, on the qualities of the Arya Sangha. Tu Patipano, underline the word Su. Su meaning well. Good. Supati Pano often referred to as good conduct. Okay. Pati Pano means uh, the practice of or the conduct of. So Supati Pano, uh, well conducted, uh, good practice or good conduct. And as, well, as I mentioned earlier, Savak Sango. Savak means a listener, a person who heard from someone else, who learns, in this case, learn from the Buddha and become part of the community. So these are some basic Pali terms we should uh, get acquainted with. And basically, Supati Pannu Bhagavato Savaka Sangho, the first quality, uh, often translated as having practiced well or of good conduct, they, they are referring to the uh, practice according to Dhamma Vinaya. Again, another term. Dhamma Vinaya refers to the teachings of the Buddha. The 45 years of teaching the Buddha taught in Northern India are called the Dhamma Vinaya. Today, we just loosely call it Buddhism, but more specifically is Dhamma Vinaya. And the Buddha often refers to his teaching in the suttas as Dhamma Vinaya. So Dhamma Vinaya includes the Noble Eightfold Path, or often referred to as the threefold training of Sila, Samadhi, Panya which most of us are familiar. So Supati Panno Bhagavato Savaka Sango refers to uh, the practice of Sila Samadhi Panya. It means following the Noble Eightfold Path. And it is just, this page is just a reminder. The Noble Eightfold Path contains these um, eight factors regrouped into three whole training. 
of starting with wisdom, then we have the <coughs> uh, moral training and then concentration. And why do we start with wisdom? Just as a reminder, because everything we do, that means out of the eight, number one, we must have right view or right understanding so that the other seven are done properly, not simply do. So jump straight to the aspect of mindfulness. A lot of people talk about, oh, mindfulness is very important. But as long as mindfulness is not done with right view or right understanding, then that mindfulness is not samasati. It is wrong mindfulness. So very often you find mindfulness taught in the West, now what we call circular mindfulness. It means nothing to do with religion. Uh, that kind of mindfulness is not right mindfulness, though it may happen to have some uh, qualities similar to what the Buddha taught, but many other aspects are not what the Buddha taught. It is mindfulness, but it is not right mindfulness. So beware of, uh, of people, uh, articles or videos, uh, people training you on mindfulness. But we have to ask our questions as Buddhists, what kind of mindfulness are they teaching? Okay, so circular mindfulness is not necessarily right mindfulness. Right mindfulness is only found in, in the Noble Eightfold Path. So you always start with right understanding and right view, which directs the tone and the approach of the other seven uh, factors along the Noble Eightfold Path. That's why wisdom starts first. We start with right understanding and we get enlightened with right understanding. So it goes one round. Now, the aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path, how important is the Noble Eightfold Path? There are many, many suttas where the Buddha uh, deliberates on the various aspects of the Noble Eightfold Path. But in this case, I decided to take an excerpt from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, where uh, before the Buddha passed away, uh, the wanderer Subhada, this is a young, younger man, went up to the Buddha and he asked the Buddha, Master Kotama, there are those ascetics and Brahmins who lead an order and a community and teach a community. They are well-known and famous religious founders regarded as holy by many people at the time, namely Purana Kasyapa, Makali Gosala, Niganta Nataputta, Sanjaya Belapti Putta, uh, Pakuda Kachayana, and Ajita Kesa Kambala. Now, if you count the number of teachers here, there are six. These are the six well-known teachers, other, not including the Buddha, six well-known teachers during the time of the Buddha. Each of them have their own philosophies. Each of them may touch on aspects of karma. That's why I frequently, when, when people talk about karma, especially to a non-Buddhist, we have to be very, very careful. Uh, many of these six teachers also teach karma, but karma per their own philosophy, is different from the Brahmanical aspect of karma and is also different from what the Buddha taught with respect to karma. So when we talk about karma, we cannot rely on the word karma. We have to know who taught that. If it's from the Buddha, then it's called the, from the Buddhist point of view. If it's just general karma, it could be anybody's interpretation of what karma means. So during the time of the Buddha, there were six contemporary views and probably six kinds of karma interpretation, not even including Brahmanical yet. So there will be number seven. So many, many confusing ideas. Same words, because this is the Indian language at the time, but there are many ideas floating around. So, and uh, so Pada continues. According to their claims, their own claims, did all of them have direct knowledge or none of them or some of them? So Subhada is saying there are six famous teachers around, each uh, claiming this and that. And did all of them have direct knowledge? That means are they enlightened or none of them? Or maybe out of the six, maybe some of them are enlightened. So Subhada was posing this question to the Buddha. So while still at Kutinara, the Buddha responded, if enough, Subhada, let that be. I shall teach you the Dhamma. Listen and pay close attention. I will speak. Uh, this is a very common term uh, which the Buddha uses uh, for his congregation, especially his monks. Now, the Buddha continues, Subhada, in whatever teaching and training, 
Again, if it's in Pali, it will be in whatever Dhamma Vinaya, the Noble Eightfold Path is not found. There is no true ascetic found, no second ascetic, no third ascetic, and no fourth ascetic. And in whatever Dhamma Vinaya, the Noble Eightfold Path is found, there is a true ascetic found, a second ascetic, a third ascetic, and a fourth ascetic. And in this teaching and training or Dhamma Vinaya, the Noble Eightfold Path is found. Only here is there a true ascetic, here a second ascetic, here a third ascetic, and here a fourth ascetic. Other sets are empty of ascetics. So what does the Buddha mean? Okay, well, most of you will be wondering, what is the Buddha talking about? True ascetic, and then second, and third, and fourth ascetic. Well, here the Buddha is re referring to the stages of enlightenment. The true ascetic is the one who has uprooted uh, the first three defilements and become attained stream winner or attain the first stage of sainthood, Sotapan. The second ascetic the Buddha is referring to is the second stage of enlightenment, Sakatagami. And the third ascetic are those who attain the third stage of sainthood, Anagami. And the fourth ascetic, that of Arahat, it means fully enlightened, the disciple of the Buddha. So here, clearly, uh, the importance of the Noble Eightfold Path, it is only through Noble Eightfold Path can one uproot the defilements and attain our heart food, okay, enlightenment or liberation. So moving on, Uju Patipanno Bhagavato Sahavaka Sangho, Sangha of the Blessed One's Disciples, who have practiced straightforwardly. This is one way of translating the term Uju Patipanno. Other translations, including living uprightly, the straight way, practice directly, and uh, Nalanda would prefer to use the term upright conduct. Why? Patipanno is conduct or the practice, and Uju is upright or straight, direct. And what does Uju Patipanno Bhagavato Tavaka Sango talk about? Conduct or practice of the threefold training or middle path by avoiding the extremes of sensual pleasures and self mortification and abandoning the faults of body, speech, and mind. So essentially, is avoiding the extremes of sensual pleasures and self-mortification. So where did we come across this advice before? Huh? In the 45 years of teaching? Well, while at Banaras, in the Deer Park, Isi Patana, the Buddha addressed the group of five mendicants. Mendicants, these Two extremes should not be cultivated by one who has gone forth. What two? Indulgence in sensual pleasures, which is low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. And indulgence in self mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and pointless. For avoiding these two extremes, the Buddha woke up by understanding the middle way of practice, which gives vision and knowledge leads to peace, direct knowledge, awakening, and, and extinguishing. And the sutta continues. And this is from the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta, the first sermon given by the Buddha. And this paragraph is the first few paragraphs in the sutta itself. So the Buddha starts off by uh, telling the five ascetics uh, to avoid okay, these two uh, uh, practices. Now, the Buddha himself, at least before he became the Buddha, when he was Prince Siddhartha, he was indulging in sensual pleasures, okay, in a way piled on by his father, King Sudodana. Why? Because the thinking was that as long as one was uh, involved in sensual pleasures of music, of good food, of pleasant environment, good company, uh, that one would stay in the palace. And the Buddha described this as low, crude, ordinary, ignoble, and pointless. Why? Because it comes to an end sooner or later. It will come to an end. And what about indulgence in self-mortification, which is painful, ignoble, and pointless again? Painful, that's clearly so. Self-mortification describes torturing your body. That was the idea during those days. So Prince Siddhartha enjoyed sensual pleasures while he was still a prince. When he renounced the world uh, and during the six years, of trying to gain enlightenment, 
he practiced the common idea during those days, that of ascetism, which is essentially self-modification. So uh, ascetic Gautama had a lot of experience regarding self-modification. He almost died until he came to his senses and realized that this was pointless and definitely very, very painful. He gave up all those extremes of sexual pleasures and self-modification. And avoiding this, he took the middle way of practice. And from then on, he took food and soon he gained enlightenment underneath the Bowie tree. So this was the first thing he mentioned to the five ascetics because the five ascetics were very familiar with self-modification as they subscribed to the idea at that time. So what is this middle way of practice? The Buddha continues in the Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta. It is simply this noble eightfold path of right view, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right immersion or right concentration. Now, in the, I will just backtrack a little bit. Why does the Buddha call it the noble eightfold path? First of all, it is a path, the path leading to liberation. Leaving, uh, what they are leading to liberation, leading to peace, and so on. Why is it noble? Because it ennobles oneself, makes yourself more noble than, than you are right now. Noble in this case, Arya, that means it transforms you. So the path is transformative. And what is this path comprising for? Co comprising of eight factors, but not just eight, they are eightfold. Uh, that's the difference between noble eight path and noble eightfold path. The eightfold path is because each and every factor there that we need to develop, it supports each other. So all eightfold, although we are aiming at right view, uh, the other factors along the path also help and fortify and, and uh, uh, bring up the aspect. So it is not practice one by one. Actually, you're, although you are aiming at one, say right thought or right speech, you are actually summoning all the other factors to come together to support you, to help you. So it is, that's why it is eightfold. So this is that middle way of practice, which gives vision and knowledge and leads to peace, direct knowledge, awakening. Now moving on to the third quality of the Tanga. Nyanya Patipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sangdo. Uh, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced methodically. Now, one thing I need to highlight is uh, very often in the various groups, not necessarily in Nalanda, but many other places, uh, this is often wrongly pronounced. They pronounce it as N-A-Y-A, Naya Patipanno. And Naya is different from Nyaya. The N with the, the curvy line above it is pronounced N-Y, Nya. So, Nyaya Patipanno, not Naya Patipanno. So, please note the pronunciation. These are two different words, okay? So, Nyaya Patipanno, Patipanno with the practice or conduct. Nyaya is methodically, insightfully uh, on the right path. And Nalanda uses the word wise conduct, okay? These are the different flavors regarding this particular word. So what does Nyanya Patipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sango talk about? Conduct or practice of the uh, threefold training or middle path to gain insight into the way things are with the aim of attaining and realizing, realizing Nibbana. Now, there are two aspects of this sentence. To gain insight into the way things are is one. And the other one is aiming to attain and realize Nibbana. Now, insight into the way things are. Why is this important? Uh, it is because we are deluded. Uh, we have ignorance within us. And the purpose of getting enlightenment is to uproot this ignorance so that we can see things as they are. Now, we are seeing things, uh, interpreting things as we want it to be, based on our own delusion, our own ignorance. We are living in our own dream world. So we are not living... Uh, according to the way things are. And therefore, this practice is to have insight, to understand, to see clearly, 
to, to open the curtain, to clean the dirty window or spectacles which we are wearing so that we can see things as they are, to see it clearly. And when we see things as they clearly are, we attain Nibbana. We realize Nibbana. We can see Nibbana right in front of us. Okay, So Nibbana is not uh, this address or that address in heaven or whatever. It is with us. We just have to clean our defilements, uproot our defilements away, and we can realize Nibbana here and now. Now, there are many, many sutras uh, the Buddha has given in the 45 years of teaching describing various aspects of Nibbana, some positively, some negatively. This one I'm quoting from Bahia Sutta from the Udana, uh, where the Buddha encountered a, a person called Bahia. Uh, the Sutta is named after him. Bahia, who wanted to know. In this case, uh, Bhante, teach me the Dhamma. Sublime one for the sake of my long-term benefit and happiness. And what was the circumstances of Bahia? Um, what they call requesting the Buddha to teach him. Well, Bahia came from another part of the India. He heard about uh, the existence of a Buddha uh, in this particular locality, and he rushed. He himself was a, a teacher, okay, a, a well-known teacher in his parts. He had students, but he took leave of them temporarily and he decided to journey to look for the Buddha. And when he found the Buddha, the Buddha was going on arms round. He was, the Buddha was walking along Pinta Chara just before noon. And he, he didn't want to wait. He was so enthusiastic. He came up to Buddha and requested the Buddha to teach him immediately while the Buddha was still going on arms round. And the Buddha uh, multiple times uh, said that it is not the appropriate time I am on Pintachara. Can you wait afterwards? And after the third time, the Indian way is you have to repeat things three times to mean that, to emphasize that you mean it and you want it uh, immediately. And then the Buddha will consider. In this case, the last uh, request, uh, Bahia mentioned, teach me the Dhamma sublime one for the sake of my long-term benefit and happiness. And the Buddha while standing in the middle of the streets, uh, partway through his Pintachara, decided to teach Bahia. So the Buddha said, Therefore, Bahia, this is how you are to train yourself. This is about the shortest teaching the Buddha has ever given for someone, in this case Bahia, who finally attained Arahathut in, in the middle of the Indian street. Okay, in the scene, there will just there will be just the scene. In the herd, there will be just the herd. In the sense, there will be just the sense. In the cognize, there will be just the cognize. This, Bahia, is how you are to train yourself. Now, this seemingly very, very short uh, 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 first portion of the sutta is very, very telling. Now, in the scene, talking about our, our eye, we see things. And the Buddha says, there will be just the scene. Okay. Why is this very telling? Because most of us say, I saw this. Notice, I add in the word, I. The person saw this. We attach, uh, we are so attached to ourselves, we have the wrong idea that there is a permanent, unchanging entity that is called I. So you, in your sentence, when you talk to your friends, I saw this. But the Buddha says, in the scene, there will be just the scene. Notice, there is no I. The absence of I. Okay, and what is seen? What is this seeing aspect or the hearing aspect or the sense aspect? These are just mere processes, functions of, in this case, the eye receives light images. Uh, if there is light, if it's the night, pitch black at night, of course, you don't see anything. Uh, but if uh, there's light, it reflects off the item. It comes to your uh, the, the lens in your eye goes to your retina. Your retina, if it's working, sometimes some people have uh, what they call damaged retinas. Maybe they may be blind, so they cannot see. But for those with functioning retinas, it might uh, fall onto your black and white sensors and your color sensors, uh, the cones and rods and so on. And then it stimulates those cells to produce an electrical sensor uh, signal. It goes along your optic nerve. It goes to your brain, that portion of the brain that uh, 
the neurons are linked in such a way that it's able to decipher the signals from the retina. And that's how we see the, what I, I just described was a quick revision into what you called science in your school days. And basically, this is what the Buddha is referring to. In the scene, there will ju be just the scene. It is just a process of seeing. There's no one seeing. Okay, let the Buddha continue to explain this uh, in a better fashion. But here, when it is like this for you, in the scene, there is just the scene. In the herd, there is just the herd. In the sense, there is just the sense. In the cognize, there is just the cognize. Then Bahir, there will be no you in terms of this. When there is no you in terms of this, then there is no you there. When there is no you there, there is no you here, beyond or in between. In other words, no you anywhere. Just this is the end of suffering. Okay, when you understand this, this is basically realizing Nibbana, the seeing things as they are. So then while the Blessed One was teaching this brief Dhamma teaching to Bahir, Bahir's mind was liberated from the corruptions by means of non-attachment. He became an Arahat right in the middle of the the, the street while the Buddha was supposed to be going Pintachara. This is how short the teaching was. But why is it so short? Because Bahir was already very well developed. He just leaned a little bit more. Then he can attain Arahatship. Even uh, Moggallana and Venerable Sariputta needed more from the Buddha before they became Arahats. Bahir was the shortest. Just these few verses and he became Arahat already. No need to Sutapan. No need second stage, no need third stage, went straight to Arahat, right in the middle of the street. He wasn't even meditating in the sense of traditional sitting down cross-legged. He was standing there. So what is this Nibbana we often talk about? Well, uh, this morning, of course, it's not a lecture on Nibbana. I only give you some excerpts of some of the suttas, what the Buddha talks about. Now, in the Ananda Sutta from the Anguttara Nikai Book of Three, the Buddha describes in a positive man manner, this is peaceful, this is sublime. That is the stealing of all activities, the letting go of all attachments, the ending of craving, fading away, cessation, extinguishment. So this is one way in that particular Sutta, the Buddha described Nibbana. There are many, many other ways. Now, in the following Sutta, now, approaching the total freedom from Dukkha, the whole purpose of uh, uh, the Buddha's Dhamma Vinaya is freedom from Dukkha or Nibbana or liberation. Liberation from Dukkha. We do not want any more Dukkha, whether physical or mental. Mm -hmm. So, in our approach to total freedom from Dukkha, in this particular sutta, the Buddha talks about a sutta called the Nakasika Sutta. The Buddha talks about some important aspects. Uh, in this case, the Buddha, the Blessed One, picking up a little bit of dust from the, with the tip of his fingernail, said to the monks, What do you think, monks, which is greater, the little bit of dust I have picked up with the tip of my fingernail or the great earth? Uh, you notice in a number of suttas, the Buddha likes to use this obvious, uh, what they call, uh, what some people might say, a silly question where the answer is very obvious, very commonsensical. So the monks said, the great earth is far greater law. This little bit of dust, the blessed one, has picked up with the finger tip of his fingernail is next to nothing. It's not a hundred, a thousand or a hundred thousand. This little bit of dust, the blessed one, has picked up with the tip of his fingernail when compared with the great earth. So the Buddha continues, in the same way, monk, or disciple of the noble ones who is consummate in view, that means perfect in view, who has right view, an individual who has broken through to stream entry, that means attain the first stage of sainthood or sotapan, the suffering and stress that is totally ended and extinguished is far greater. That which remains in the state of having at most seven remaining lifetimes 
is next to nothing. It's not a hundred, a thousandth, or hundred thousand when compared to the previous mass of suffering. That's how great the benefit is of breaking through to the Dhamma monks. That's how great the benefit is of obtaining the Dhamma eye. Now, this particular sutta is very important. It gives us an idea. Now, in the, the second paragraph or the second last paragraph of this on this page, the Buddha talks about when compared to previous mass of suffering, he's referring to our uh, uncalculable rebirths previously. Our past is very long. Our journey in samsara has been uncomfortable. The previous mass and in each a plane of existence we have we have uh, appeared, uh, we have suffered. We have enjoyed also, but our enjoyment was short-lived. It was anicca and it became suffering. So we have been suffering for so long in samsara. And once we attain, obtain the Dhamma eye, okay, we have a breaking through to the Dhamma, uh, attain even the first stage of sainthood. We break this chain of samsara. Why? Because as a person who has attained stream entry, who, who is a sotapan, uh, the person will not, will never be reborn in any plane of existence lower than the human realm. Now, now, as you know, the Buddha discovered that there are 31 planes of existence. The human realm that we are in right now, we are number five from the bottom. So number one, two, three, four, uh, includes the hell worlds, the animal worlds, the ghost worlds, the hungry ghosts, and so on. Those are a lot of suffering planes. So the moment we attain Sotapan, we have no chance of being born, ever being born in plane of existence number one, two, three, or four. The lowest we can ever be reborn uh, if we don't attain Arahatuhut in, in this very life is as a human again. Okay. But and the Buddha continues uh, in, uh, in the uh, second last paragraph, that which remains in the state of having at most seven remaining lifetimes is next to nothing. So basically, a person who has attained the first stage of sainthood, Sotapan, has seven more lifetimes at most. And why is it called next to nothing? Well, next to nothing, seven more lifetimes compared to the, the mass of rebirths we had previously that was incalculable uh, millions and millions and billions of re rebirths previously so seven more are uh, nothing lah. okay and you cannot be ever re reborn in the lower planes lower than human realm so you are considered you have extinguished a lot of your suffering and stress already okay that's why the buddha in, the, in this case uh, taught the monks that uh, in a way, he's strongly encouraging the monks. If you don't attain arahanship, at least try to attain the Dhamma eye, to attain the first stage of sainthood. That alone, you relieves a lot of your burden, uh, your suffering and stress. And uh, if you are slow in attaining arahanship, finally, at the most, seven more lives. Okay, compared to previously, you have been suffering so much. Uh, this is nothing. So this is the nature of Nibbana, the ending of craving. The beginning in the, ten, in the case of uh, attaining Sotapan, the beginning of ending suffering and stress. And majority of it has been eliminated by your attainment of the first stage of sainthood. You're well on the way towards Nibbana, which is the perfect ending of all stress and suffering. Okay, fourth quality of the Sangha. Samichi Patipanno Bhagavato Savaka Sangha, the Sangha of the Blessed One's disciples who have practiced masterfully. Now, Samichi can be translated as masterfully, uh, accomplished, or dutiful. Now, this points to a very important aspect. It is talking about the integrity in conduct uh, and, uh, or practice of the threefold training, the middle way to be worthy of respect, of receiving requisites of veneration from other people. Okay, the integrity uh, to, to practice the dutiful attitude uh, and having masterfully practiced the Noble Eightfold Path to attain Nibbana. Uh, this is called putting effort into practice. 
And in this particular uh, uh, called the Pinta Pata, uh, Parisuddhi Visutta, the Buddha talks of, talk to a group of monks that when they go on Pinta Tara, along the path that I went for arms, they should reflect, huh? along the path I went for arms, or in the place I wandered for arms, or along the path that I returned from arms, that means having collected arms, was that the, the monk is supposed to continue practice. Okay. Now, the practice of the, the, the Sangha members, because why do, you, do people want to become Sangha members? Because they want to enroll themselves into full-time practice. Full-time practice is not nine to five. Full-time practice means the moment you wake up, your eyes open from your sleep, you are already practicing. Right through the whole day in all activities, right through to when you close your eyes to go to sleep. Okay, that is called full-time practice as a Sangha member. And for Sangha members, he conscientiously practice. And in this case, the Buddha says, with respect to going for Pinta Chara, when you're going out for arms, uh, uh, you're wandering for arms, or you're returning from your journey outside uh, with the collected arms, um, you are always practicing. And the Buddha says, to reflect whether uh, was there any desire or greed or hatred or delusion or repulsion in my heart for sights known by the eye. So when you go to Pintachara, of course, you open your eyes to walk along uh, to collect arms and things, may, uh, certain ideas or thinking may appear in your mind, whether they are desire, whether they are greed, rooted in hatred or delusion. Uh, what do you do? Suppose that upon checking, the monk knows that there was such desire, greed, hate, delusion, or repulsion in their heart. They should make an effort to give up those unskillful qualities. Uh, so with respect to all these unwholesome thinking or roots, they should make an effort to give up those unskillful qualities. Now, this is not during a sitting meditation, you know. This is when the monk is going on pintachara or returning from pintachara. So while walking around with the arms bowl, the, the, the monk is still practicing, trying to give up any unskillful quality that may have arisen. But suppose that upon checking, a monk knows that there is no such desire or greed or hate or delusion or repulsion in their heart. They should meditate with rapture and joy training day and night in skillful qualities. So clearly, uh, even in many of the suttas, the Buddha always says to give up, to know and to give up unskillful qualities and to cultivate skillful qualities. And the Buddha continues. That was talking about sight known by the eye. And the Buddha says to continue. What about hearing? When you go out on Pintachara, you might hear things via your ear. You might smell with your nose. You might taste with your tongue. You may have touch with respect to your body and even thoughts that arise in your mind. You are ever mindful through the, all these six sense doors. And even the monk who is still on the other, you also need to reflect. Have I given up the five hindrances? Have I completely understood five grasping aggregates? Pancha, Upadana, Kanda. And I put dot, dot, dot there. That means there are many more reflections where the Buddha encourages the monk to reflect on even while going on interchara. So this is not a formal sit down uh, after makan or before makan uh, uh, meditation, but even while walking also there is constant reflection and monitoring. Uh, so this is how the, the, the monastic, those who have enrolled on the full-time course as Sangha members who with integrity uh, follow the Buddha's advice, the Buddha's encouragement to practice uh, where, uh, whatever activity they are doing uh, so that uh, they are worthy of the food they receive in their arms bowl, uh, worthy of the donation from the lay people, from those people who offer uh, the requisites and so on. So that covered the the first four qualities, Supatipano, Ujupatipano, 
Nyanya Pati Pandu, Samichi Pati Pandu. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the next section has no qualities of the Sangha, but it reflects that those who have conscientiously uh, practiced uh, quality number one, two, three, and four, or possess these qualities, are almost certain to be uh, one of the four types of noble disciples as take, when taken as pairs or, uh, or part of the eight when taken as individual types. And because they are Aryas, that means they are noble, they are worthy disciples, they are worthy of gifts, worthy of hospitality, worthy of offerings, worthy of respect, and an incomparable field of merit for the world. Now, in these last few slides, I would just like to highlight, okay, this is a man, meant to be a summary. Uh, in the Mahaparini Nibbana Sutta, the Buddha gave uh, many, many talks. In this case, uh, in this case to the Sangha members. Now, on his last journey towards Kusinara before the passing away, the Buddha met many groups of Sangha members. And in this case, the Buddha was talking about uh, conditions of welfare for the Sangha. Okay. And here, the Buddha touches on seven good qualities. The, the seven listed here that of having confidence, of moral shame, of fear of misconduct, uh, proficient learning, uh, of uh, resolute or energy, of being mindful, of being wise. All these seven you have come across before in the few weeks ago. That was in the Chula Punama Sutta that we covered. Okay, and this is repeated here, this list in one page, repeated in the Mahaparinipuni, Nibbana Sutta. And the Buddha also talks about, encourages the Sangha to perform, to meditate, and uh, encourage the development of the seven factors of enlightenment. The factors being mindfulness, investigation into phenomena, energy, bliss, tranquility, concentration, and equanimity. And importantly, so long bhikkhus, as these seven conditions leading to welfare and endure among the bhikkhus, and the bhikkhus are known for it, their growth is to be expected, not their decline. So this is yet another factor that helps uh, to prolong the Buddha sasana. That means those who are practicing all these advices given by the Buddha. Now, a quick summary, I only showed you earlier two pages. These particular pages mention uh, the seven community activities of the Sangha members, the seven habits to avoid, seven good qualities, which I showed you, seven factors of enlightenment, which I showed you. But, but the Buddha also talks about this, the seven perceptions to cultivate, the six conditions to be remembered. In the end, so long because as these conditions leading to welfare and dure among the bhikkhus, and the bhikkhus are known for it, their growth is to be expected not their decline. And ultimately, their growth and expected, that is as far as the movement is concerned. But as long as they practice well uh, to the first four of Supatipanno, Uju Patipanno, Nyaya Patipanno, and Samaji Patipanno, there will be no lack of enlightened Aryas within the Sangha. So the Arya Sangha will continue to be available to us. And here, back to the last portion of Maha Parinibbana Sutta, talking about the ascetic Subhada who asked the Buddha a question regarding uh, whether the other six teachers were enlightened or not, or some of them or none of them. The ascetic Kotama, okay, in the presence of the Blessed One, received admission and the higher ordination because he asked permission from the Buddha to become one of the disciples of the Buddha after the Buddha gave the lecture regarding the Noble Eightfold Path. And from the time of his ordination, the venerable Subhada remained alone, secluded, heedful, ardent, and resolute. And before long, he attained to the goal for which a worthy man goes forth rightly from home to homelessness, the supreme goal of the holy life, and having by himself the realized it with higher knowledge, he dwelt within. He knew and destroyed its birth. The higher life is fulfilled. Nothing more is to be done. And beyond this life, 
nothing more remains. And the Venerable Subhada became yet another among the Arahats, and he was the last disciple converted by the Blessed One himself. So that is how he, Venerable Subhada joined the Arya Sangha. So clearly, the, uh, these four qualities that if we were to emulate ourselves, we will join the ranks of the Arya Sangha too. So with that, uh, may the good doctrine long endure.